Yeah, the only reason I care about my hair is because of the bunker cam. You know, if it weren't for the bunker cam, I wouldn't have to um, say that my hair needs straightened up. So uh, my apologies to those who are listening to the, the audio files only. Uh, but if you're listening to the audio files only and you don't realize it, we have a bunker cam running continuously in the bunker capturing these broadcasts from my bunker in South America. Thank you very much. I said I was going to say something about a slave of Christ, and this is a practical application for you, is that a slave really has a simple life. A slave only has to do what his or her master tells him or her to do. And that can be very simple. Now, I'm not saying that slavery was ever a great thing. I'm not saying that slaves were treated well. I'm just saying that it's a simple life. You're delivered of many decisions. You know, aren't, aren't the, the decisions in life uh, make you crazy? Things that happen to you of which you have no control make you crazy. And so you wring your hands, you despair over it, and you said, oh, I could have done this, I should have done that. And um, plus you're afraid of what's coming on the world. You find yourself boiling like a frog in a pot with the rest of the hapless frogs. <coughs> oh, yeah, that's a pig. Sorry. I don't know how to do a frog. Okay, you're boiling in a pot with the other hapless pigs, <coughs> and you need comfort. You need immediate comfort. I wrote about this in my ZWTF newsletter. Uh, go to it. It's part four of the Roman series last year, and I have found great comfort in telling myself like a mantra over and over again, or is it a mantra? I, I, who cares? I am a slave of Christ. Paul calls himself that. A slave has no control over things. Now, relatively, yeah, I have control. I brush my teeth. I get out of bed. I decide to go to work. But above that, there is someone operating in me to will and to work for the sake of his delight. That's Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Yeah, I'm working out my life, but I'm only working out what God is working in. And I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. So I just like go around and do what he has me to do. So what right has a slave to complain? I have a complaint problem. I sometimes murmur about my situations in life. And I bitch. And I think you do too. So th this is not good. It's not healthy. We're not going to be condemned for it. It's understandable. But what I'm saying is when you're a slave of Christ... You think, well, what, am, what else happened? That wasn't my decision. I didn't make myself the way I am. My master did. I didn't put myself in this circumstance. My master did. Even if I relatively put myself in the circumstance, I decided to walk into that store that got robbed and I got shot and now I'm in the hospital. I could have not walked into that store. Well, no, I couldn't have not done it because my life was planned out before me before I was even born. All my days were planned, as the psalmist says, and um, God is giving all life and breath and all, Acts chapter 17. In him, we live and move and are, same chapter, Acts 17. So this comforts me to know that I have a master and it ain't me. And so whatever situation I find myself in, whether relatively I got myself into it or a meteor fell on my head or something out of my purview out of my control well it's still my master doing it to me i'm a slave i have no choice in the matter absolutely speaking and that ladies and gentlemen is a comfort all right for those of you getting impatient saying zender get to chapter one verse one i'm still laying foundations but i'm going to give you a juicy tidbit john was taken the, the disciple John was on the island of Patmos for the word of God. Now, I always thought that he was exiled there. Maybe tradition says he was exiled there by Caesar or who, whatever other Roman freak was in charge of the empire in those days. But I think maybe he, God sent him there. Maybe he had a relative on Patmos or maybe he liked the weather. Maybe he had a summer cottage. I don't know, but he was in a remote place where God showed him the future. But no, God not only showed him the future, he went to be in the Lord's day. He didn't just see it, he went there. I don't know if you quite grasp the marvel of the fact that God has decided everything ahead of time and all the events that are future are to him just like the past. So John went and saw 
not things that are going to happen. He went and saw the things happening. This is so ultra cool. Which means, this is the cool part. If John is going into the future, not just seeing it, going into it, and he is seeing things unfolding during the tribulation and describing them as he's watching them like he's sitting in a theater watching a movie, except he's not watching a dramatization, he's watching the very events, then if we are snatched away before that time, and we're completed in Christ prior to the events of Revelation, which I believe we are, and I have verses to show you that. If I don't get to them today, I'll get to them tomorrow. Then John went to a time when we were complete. He breathed the air of the environment that has us seated at the right hand of God and ruling the universe. He just didn't mention it. God didn't show that to him, but he breathed the air of a universe that is headed up by the entire body of Christ, not just the head, which means you and me. John, if he didn't witness it, was aware of us complete. That's how guaranteed this thing is. That somebody, two people in fact, went and saw it done. They saw it done. That thing that we're longing for, hoping for, for two people saw it done. John, who went to be in spirit in the Lord's day, and the Apostle Paul, who went to the third heaven. Not the third heaven in space. I mean, not to say that he went in his time to some third layer of celestial kingdomhood. He went to the third heaven in time, because in time, there are three different heavens and three different earths. I talked about this at the Florida conference. Go to studyshelf.com, click on videos, go to um, Dania Beach conference or Florida conference, and I give a talk there called the three earths. And the three earths have a corresponding heaven. And Paul, I believe, saw the body of Christ complete. He didn't see a glimpse of it. He went to the actual time when it would be real. No wonder the man spoke with such assurance. Wouldn't you love to have that assurance that this thing we're hoping for is not just a theory, but it's real? Well, it is real. It's so real that God talks about it as though it's real. Read Ephesians 2, how he seats us among the celestials, among the celestials, and he speaks of it in the present tense, which is a figure of speech known as prolepsis, which is God giving us a break and speaking so strongly about something that he speaks as though it were done because it's so guaranteed. Such a sure thing. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Seats us together among the celestials. No, it's in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. Seats us together among the celestials. So he sent two people to breathe the air of our future reality. And it's a reality. It's not a theological hope. It's not a doctrine that's cold and dry and baseless. Rather, it's a declaration of God. How's that? And God, according to Peter, is not slack concerning his promises. Oh, yeah. He takes his time. I get that. I know that. He takes his time, but he's not slack concerning them. So just as sure as there is a one-world government being built today, just as sure as the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem stands today in the Middle East, just as sure as the man of lawlessness will arrive and arise, just as sure as the years of the indignation will be seven and not six and not eight, just as sure are the times coming after that, 
after these things, when the blood and the destruction will lead to a kingdom on this earth that we cannot even imagine how it will be to have Satan bound for a thousand years and to have peace upon the earth and to not have to kill weeds anymore. But not only that, we, the members of the body of Christ, will be, talk about this tomorrow now, transferred spiritually, powerfully, decisively out of this cosmos, of this system. And we will be transferred to a realm that is so mind-boggling, amazing, and wonderful that eyes not seen nor ear heard what God has made ready for his slaves.